Welcome to another unboxing video for my YouTube channel. As you can see, I've already opened this package and had time to read the book so I can give a full review. A little background information first. In January 2018, I attended the All Your Bass Music Festival, centered around video game music, held in Nottingham, here in England. And that was a celebration of video game music composers and performers. Among the Commodore 64 highlights was a performance and lecture by Dr. Rob Hobbard. And Rob had been given his doctorate in music by Abate University. And there was another key lecturer from Abate present that day, Dr. Kenny McAlpine. Kenny was presenting a lecture called Chips of Everything about uh, chip tunes and how video game music has touched the mainstream from the single Tetris by Dr. Spin to the modern era with Game Boy performers and covers of video game music. And so part of that lecture was inspired by a book that Kenny was writing. And here we have that very book, Bits and Pieces, published in December 2018 by Oxford University Press, Bits and Pieces, A History of Chip Tunes. to Shona Wigeni and Iona, his wife and children. Introduction first. And he referred to this in the lecture, how he was watching the children, the CBBC television program, Hey Dougie, when he heard the Donkey Kong music. As he talks about how the word chip tune of evolved and what this book is going to study so looking back at 8-bit games looking through the chip tune sound and then also focusing on several key machines so start off with the Atari VCS in chapter one talking about Pong and then the dedicated home console how the programmers had to race the beam it's the TIA chip from the VCS, square wave, the frequency table. So there's examples. Here we can see at the top of this page we have a transcription of Pressure Cooker, one of the earliest video game pieces written by a professional musician based on notes that would work. The arcade and VCS music from Dig Dug, the arcade at the top here, and the simplified version for the VCS. Again, Dig Dug. So then we're talking about Atari 8 bit, adding chips to the original VCS, the end of Atari, and here the Pac Man theme from the arcade game and how it sounded on the VCS. We're repeating the myth about millions of ET cartridges being buried. So chapter two then looks at the ZX Spectrum. So the Mark 14 and the ZX81 preceded that. The Sinclair Spectrum, the Beeper, 
a little speaker that actually generated the beeps. Beep command. How to condense two channels into one. Arrangement of Beethoven's Piano Sonata number 14 appears in Jet Set Winnie. These transcriptions are a nice touch because it does explain a lot about the musicality and how it was created. Mine is in game melody and the jump sound effect, so you can see how the two overlap. Then talking about on the beautiful Blue Danube there, pulse width modulation, the theme from Zombie Zombie. Then Wham's the music box. Talking about how Tim Fallin and other Spectrum musicians created multi channel music. The end of the Spectrum, the Commodore 64. Talking about, of course, the 6581 SID chip. How you needed to poke values, simple basic programs, the control registers, and it's both sad and good to read quotes from the late Ben Dalgleish. Then on to talking about Lazy Jones and David Whitaker's soundtrack. And of course the unfortunate then issues later with Zombie Nation, more with Ben Douglas, how he created some of his music, Rob Hubbard, actual musical notation from Rob Hubbard here, Commando, and retelling the classic story about how he made the music, Natalie, then on to loading music, an excerpt from Kong Strike Mac, Kong Strikes Back with its arpeggios, fast arpeggios, creating that neat sound onto sampled sounds. Chapter 4 then, Nintendo's NES, and Famicom, and how it had a slightly different sound chip, but crucially, unlike the Spectrum, the NES could work independent of the main processor. Talking about Koshi Kondo and his amazing work, the underwater theme here from Super Mario Brothers. The overworld theme and how it was structured, particularly so it could uh, use the uh, sound effects at the same time without losing too much of the melody. Chapter 5 then looks at Sound Tracker, starting to discuss the Fairlight, the C64 Music Maker, the Sound Monitor by Chris Hulsbeck, and obviously then Chris moved on to the Amiga with the Paula Sound chip, Amiga 500, the Ultimate Sound Tracker, Gus Nabarski, and how Mod files then became so important, bundling the sequences and the samples together. Talking about emulation of other sound chips. Going underground, hacking and creating sound from hack chips. So going back to the early days of the Home Computer Club, that from Bill Gates. Crack screen, so talking about crackers and then into the demo scene and competitions. Then on to chapter seven, the Game Boy. The earliest one of the earliest handheld games, Metal's Auto Race, the Simon console and the Microvision, which so interchangeable cartridges, Nintendo's very successful game and watch series, and on to the original Game Boy. And here again, we mentioned Dr. Spin Tetris and the Game Boy Camera, which actually came with a little bit of music software itself. 
and talking about nano loop. It's Trippy H play mode. Nano loop. How nano loop does its thing. Uh, onto a little sound DJ. So another tracker this time for the Game Boy playing. Talking about playing with the Game Boy Live. Beyond the handheld. Modified Commodore 64 belonging to Mark Knight, which has got added controls here for the filter and then the Messiah synth cart and Prophet 64 cartridges. The Spectrum manual challenges you to write a program that will play all of Gustav Mahler's first symphony. And of course, someone had to do it. So, Matt Westcott, with the help of Dylan Smith, uh, Spectrum event, synchronised multiple Spectrums, Alex Spectrums, to play the whole of that symphony. Now you can add to others. So, Chapter 8 then deals with net labels and archives and playing music live. Chip music, chip music live, fake bit fans and 8 bit covers. So, talking about Nintendo, Nintendo Core, Mr. Bungle, the early sex to really make an interesting cover. So, talking about how various bands crossed over covers in games. Talking about Back in Time, Back in Time Live are still here. Shows Ben Dalglish introducing Rob Hubbard. They're not actually playing together at that point. That's Ben introducing Rob Hubbard at Back in Time Brighton in 2003. I was there. Talking about Tower YouTube. This allowed people to share their chip music. Hardware based on classic chips. So the SID station. And so Sid. And then finally chips of everything. So talking about video games in the museum. Some of the scandals over copying chip tunes. Obviously this is about Timberland. Taking uh Liberties with Acid Jazz Evening, apart from the uh, Sunny turning into Do It, a track for Nelly Furtado and the subsequent lawsuit, which was deeply flawed. And then Chipping the Future, what is the future of Sid Music Acknowledgements. And then, like a lot of academic books, this has footnotes and extra annotations to help you and there's quite a lot of web links, a glossary of terms, which is handy if you're a beginner. And then a packed reference print and online. References. Then broadcast film and sound recordings and software. And then the index. So quotes from Image in a Heap and Rob Hubbard on the back. Senior lecturer in the School of Design and Informatics at Abateo University. Well, when this was written, he's actually now taking up a new post. So I found this a fascinating read, not least because I am a, a chiptune musician. I create music with the Commodore 64. But also because I know quite a few people involved in the book. Names like Chris Abbott, the late Ben Dalgleish... Rob Hubbard, Mark T.D. Knight, who was interviewed as well. And so, if you're interested in an in-depth look at the history of chiptunes, how the scene evolved, and a lot of the hardware involved, then this is definitely worth picking up. Keep watching my YouTube channel for more unboxing videos, gameplay videos, and reviews.